Good morning. Uh, welcome all. We're just going to give this another minute as people pop on and then we're going to get started. Okay, I think we're ready to start. So first of all, thank you for everyone uh, joining us today. Uh, my name is Emily Ryan, and I'm gonna be the moderator for, for today's session. Uh, I'm gonna start by saying uh, thank you for joining It's Boston University and the Institute for Sustainable Energy uh, for this workshop series. This is the first in our series looking at where energy storage is headed. And today we are focusing on integrating experimental and computational approaches across scales. So as I said, my name is Emily Ryan. I'm an associate director here, director here at the Institute for Sustainable Energy and also an associate professor in mechanical engineering and materials science and engineering. Um, I'd also like to thank my other organizers for this series, uh, Srikanth Gopalan and Jorg Werner, who are also in mechanical engineering and materials science and engineering, and also Saha Srisada, who's in electrical and computer engineering and also material science and uh, engineering here at Boston University. So thank them all for organizing this series. As I said, this is the first of four. So uh, I'm thrilled to have you uh, join the ISC today for this presentation. Um, it is, we are partnering actually with the College of Engineering and Materials Science and Engineering to bring you this series. Um, if you are interested in learning more about the ISC, the Institute for Sustainable Energy, I, I encourage you to take a look at our website at the bottom of the page there. We do a lot of research in the areas of energy and water systems, sustainable cities, and sustainable finance. And you can find more at our website. Um, I'm going to get right into our talk today because we have three wonderful speakers, but I want to just give you a, a thought or two I have of what we're doing here. So as I said, this is a four-part series that we're looking at um, areas of interest in the kind of the broad category of electrochemical energy storage and conversion. And really what we want to understand are some of the big challenges, problems that are really overarching this research area and not in a specific technology, not in just like lithium ion batteries or fuel cells, but kind of overarching this class of materials. And so we, we picked four topics that we think um, are of broad interest to the research community. And I know they align very well with a lot of the challenges that have come out of things like Department of Energy workshops. So today we're starting with this idea of integrating computational experimental. Um, I think this is really crucial in these complex systems where you have so many different chemi chemical and physical processes occurring at various different scales through different uh, materials and interfaces. And so trying to understand it um, via only an experimental uh, viewpoint really isn't possible. And likewise, from computational alone, you can't do it. So the questions of how do we really bring them together and integrate the tools that we have on both sides to better advance these um, technologies is really what we're looking at talking about today. So I'm, I'm very excited to hear what our speakers have to say and also to encourage a broader conversation with the audience, the community that's here today. Um, so before I get into the introduction of the speakers and, and let them start their talks, let me just give you the, the agenda very briefly. Um, as you know, we have three speakers here. Uh, they will each give us about 20 minute uh, conversation on their research or some of their thoughts in this area. And then at the end, we will have uh, a moderated uh, conversation uh, uh, with questions from the audience. Um, in this uh, system here, if you have questions for any of the speakers or general overall questions for all speakers, please use that Q&A function uh, to type them in. I will be moderating that and bringing them up at the end. So I really encourage you to participate via the Q&A. Okay. So without further ado, I'm going to get into an introduction of the speakers and we'll jump into the talks. So first of all, we have uh, Figel Bruchette, who's an associate professor in chemical engineering at uh, MIT, just across the river. And he'll be talking to us on combining experiment and computation to advance redox flow batteries for grid energy storage. Um, Fick is an associate professor, as I said, his group seeks to advance the science and engineering of electrochemical technologies to enable a sustainable energy economy. Um, looking at both redox flow batteries for grid storage and also electrochemical processing for carbon dioxide and biomass. Our second speaker is going to be Partha Majerki, who's a professor at mechanical engineering at Purdue, looking at electrochemical physics and analytics at scales. And his group really focuses on mesoscale physics and analytics, including an emphasis on transport, chemistry, microstructure and interface interactions in energy storage and conversion. And then our final speaker will be uh, David Pender Prendergast, who's the facility director um, for theory of nanostructure materials at the molecular foundry 
at Lawrence Berkeley National Labs. And he will be talking about simulating electrochemically relevant interfaces coupled with X-ray spectroscopy. Um, and he joined the Foundry back in 2007 and over the last couple of decades has developed a very broad multidisciplinary research program involving X-ray science at the advanced light source and spanning chemical and material sciences, combining both first principles electronic structure theory and electrodynamic simulations to study energy relevant processes in complex material systems. So I am very excited to have everybody here today. And with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Fick to get us started with the first talk. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Professor Ryan. Thank you to um, the organizers of the symposium uh, and thank you all to the audience and my co-presenters. I'm looking forward to um, an exciting set of discussions. Let me go ahead and share my slides here. One second. Do people see my slides? Sorry, Fick, you're back on your background. Oh dear. Let me try that again. We practiced this and it didn't work. <laughs> All right. Let me try this one more time. Share. Can you now see my slides? Wonderful. Thank you so much. Excellent. Well, apologies for that technical glitch. Um, and what I wanted to cover today uh, in this short talk is to talk a little bit about some of the reasons why computation, combining computation and experimental approaches are needed to accelerate the advancement of redox flow batteries for grid energy storage. So I'll try to motivate why I think it's very important to start to move faster. And then I'm gonna to try to provide a few examples from our laboratory, but also from other areas in literature where people have been uh, identifying new ways to accelerate development. Um, 20 minutes is not enough time to give a holistic representation of all the work that is being done in this area. So I'm gonna to try to highlight just a few of these examples, but then I'll let's try to finish up um, with a, a broader viewpoint on the importance of combining experiment and computation. So I'd like, I'd like to start off in this area and because I'm the first speaker of this particular session, I, I can kind of take a broader view, but I think a grand challenge of the 21st century is going to be addressing uh, increasing energy consumption worldwide. When I see a plot like the one I'm showing on the graph right now, um, inherently, I, I, I see this as an example of human progress. It tells me that there is a burgeoning middle class worldwide. It tells me that there are uh, basically improvements in quality of life. And it tells me that there's growth in emerging economies like China and India. Um, and so this is a story of human progress. And that's important, as we'll come to here in a second. The challenge is that, that progress is on the, uh, is on the backbone of uh, fossil generation, so the combustion of fossil fuels, um, which has been tied to carbon dioxide emissions as well as other emission sources that impact air quality and also impact climate, uh, the global climate, as shown in the graph here that I just put up. And in fact, um, from these estimations, it, uh, to prevent a fairly significant climate change that could have fairly disastrous effects on our way of life, we have to go carbon neutral almost immediately and then ultimately going carbon negative. And we need to go carbon negative uh, within a hundred years um, uh, and, in order to prevent some of the worst effects. Uh, this is a tremendous challenge because you know, the scope and scale of energy use that we're talking about dwarfs almost anything else that we've dealt with in human history. You're talking about electricity generation, you're talking about transportation, and you're even talking about industry here. And the key challenge, as I said, I would come back to this is that we need to figure out a way to, to, to make this transition without stifling economic development. So a solution cannot be that um, part of the world that is seeing a, a growth uh, and an improvements in quality of life need to take a step back. So we have to identify solutions to decouple energy demand from carbon emissions without stifling economic development. So I, I see this as the challenge that we face uh, broadly a, a, as a community. Um, there has been significant progress over the past decades. Um, I'm showing you an example here of the drop in the cost of utility scale solar, the prices of utility scale solar over the past decade. This is data from Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. And what you'll clearly see is that the cost of solar from about 2008 down to 2018 dropped about an order of magnitude to the point where solar is arguably the cheapest form of electricity generation uh, today, uh, followed by wind and then some of the other ways of generating electricity. So this is a very promising developments and show that we can make fairly rapid progress um, 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 on, on some of these topics. The challenge of course with, with solar is the intermittent nature of the resource. And the same is true for wind 
where these emerging resources, though they may be inexpensive, will necessitate the development of cost-effective energy management technologies. This could be storage, which is what I'm going to talk about today, but could also be transmission and distribution infrastructure and demand-side management technologies as well. The second is that while this is a, a very nice story, uh, renewables are a relatively small fraction of our generation capacity right now. And they're often location dependent as evidenced by this graph. There's a lot more solar in California and the Southwest than there is say in the Northeast, right? And so this lag in fossil fuel resources means that we still have some work to do. But the vision might be that for a renewable based sustainable energy economy that relies almost entirely or in large part on renewable electricity generated from solar and wind, the first thing that we would need to address is the decarbonization of electricity generation, baseload power, advances in grid, uh, electric grid infrastructure, and also the development of new microgrids to improve resiliency and flexibility. If you're able to do this, then it's much easier to think about decarbonizing transportation. While we have batteries that exist for transportation right now, many of those batteries rely on electrons that have been developed, that have been uh, sourced, excuse me, from power plants down the road that emit carbon dioxide. So you're simply moving where the emissions are coming from. We're not truly decarbonizing the way that we could do. And then finally, with cheap electrical energy available in a reliable fashion, what could we do in industry? Could there be ways to decarbonize fuel and chemical production uh, to enable process intensification through electrochemically supported or electrochemically mediated processes or even environmental remediation? But I think a lot of this starts with the decarbonization of the grid and the, the ability to provide a reliably and at a low cost electrical energy. And I think electrochemical technologies are well suited for this. And I'm gonna talk about flow batteries and my, um, my colleagues who will speak after me will talk about other technologies, but flow batteries are one potential way to do that. The attractive aspect about flow batteries for our stationary energy storage is the decoupling of power and energy. The power of the battery is determined by the size of the reactor and the energy content or energy capacity of the battery is determined by the size of the tanks. These two things can be modulated independently. And so the graph that I'm showing you here shows battery cost as a uh, capital cost up front in dollars per kilowatt hour as a function of a characteristic discharge duration, which is the energy of the battery divided by the power. What you'll see is something like the lithium ion battery uh, is a very dense uh, energy storage um, uh, uh, media, but you can't necessarily scale it independently. The power and energy is set and you're simply you know, uh, scaling out the number of batteries that you're using and daisy chaining them together. Um, in the case of a flow battery, you can independently scale power and energy, which means at low, lower durations, the cost is dominated by the power, which is the reactor. And at longer durations, the cost is dominated by the materials that are in the tank, most often the active species that is the dominant force here. And so vanadium redox flow batteries represent the current state of the art in the field. And what you can see is that vanadium redox flow batteries, even if we go out to very extended and long duration energy storage, it's difficult to see them out competing uh, <clears throat> lithium ion batteries, at least on an upfront capital cost scale. There are other reasons why you'd get a flow battery, but I don't want, I want to leave that out from this talk. And really what we want to do is identify future non-vanadium redox flow batteries. And that requires a transition of active materials going from transition metals like vanadium potentially to organics or other um, 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 uh, uh, non-metals and potentially moving away from aqueous acidic electrolytes and moving to neutral or, or non-aqueous type electrolyte systems uh, to support these active materials. And so, when I look at flow batteries, I see that they're capable of extremely low capital cost at long duration storage applications, provided that we can identify um, uh, uh, redox chemistries that are cheap enough to meet these applications. And this is sort of where the field is going, trying to go towards uh, identifying and vetting these new materials faster and faster. The challenge is that there, these, all these requirements for redox flow battery electrolyte are interconnected, right? And so a viable candidate is gonna have to meet a laundry list of, um, of favorable uh, attributes, many of which are often when you're designing the molecule or thinking about the redox active material, often oppose one another. So you have to worry about redox potential, reaction kinetics, the effective concentration, the solubility and stability across different oxidation states of the active materials, the conductivity and viscosity of the electrolytes, the, the interaction with the separator or the membrane that separates the two electrolytes, the costs of both materials and the safety of the, op of the battery operation. The important thing to realize here is that you can't have everything. There are always gonna be trade-offs and compromises 
with different active materials. And the question is really, what are the trade-offs that you wanted that you can make? And what are the trade-offs that you cannot make? And so if we look at candidates that are emerging in the field right now that we think um, will be very big in the, in the coming years, uh, one area is commodity scale inorganic materials. I'm giving you an example of something like sulfur, which would be a commodity scale inorganic material. The advantages of these approaches are the abundance of these materials. They're often associated with materials production infrastructure. So for example, this sulfur is coming from the oil and gas fields in Alberta, Canada. So the sulfur comes up with the uh, stuff out of the ground. And it may enable us to recycle and reuse waste products such as the sulfur here, which has been separated out from the oil and gas and is sitting in this pyramid. Um, the challenges with this particular approach right now are the upgrading requirements. For example, will the sulfur or the, these materials be pure enough to be used in an electrochemical device? The technical attributes, um, you know, sulfur is always going to be sulfur. Something like iron is always going to be iron. And so you're going to have certain efficiencies and reversibilities associated with those materials that you cannot really move too much. And then, of course, the cost of other system components. The other direction people are going after is engineered molecules, often through tweaks of organic chemistry, where you can start off with an, a molecular core, say drawn from a petrochemical feed stream, and you can tune that petrochemical core through molecular functionalization. And these tunable technical properties and abundant constituent elements give you the opportunity for mass production, at least for some of these targets, provided that the synthetic pathways are not too complicated. But the challenges with these kind of approach are complex molecular stability and longevity uh, challenges. How long can they last in, in a material? When they degrade, what are they gonna degrade into? Uh, and then of course the potential cost and scalability of these high performing targets. It's tough to identify a molecule that works really well and then find out that you can't scale it because the process is too complex. And so currently the way the field approaches these kind of problems is uh, this, uh, this materials discovery approach where there's an ideation and design phase um, we sort of think about new uh, organic molecules or active species through chemical intuition or through searching the literature. We identify something that's interesting, you synthesize it, you characterize what that material is to make sure you synthesize what you wanted, and then you evaluate it using a set of series of electrochemical techniques, voltammetry, electrolysis, and ultimately full cell cycling. And all throughout this process, you could have failure points. You can synthesize the material and not be able to actually make it. The chemical analysis can tell you don't have the right material, you know, up to this, it'll die within the full cell. And all of this then would lead to a redesign where you go back to the drawing board and you try to modify this material, right? So it's a design, synthesis, characterize, and learn cycle. The challenge is that these cycles are often too slow, right? Um, and especially as materials get better and better, the cycles tend to get slower and slower because the failure modes that you're looking for are increasingly subtle. And so, often, so where much of the field is going for is identifying how do you accelerate these kind of design loops and potentially how do you automate them? And just as an example here, I'm using some work from Jay Caesar, the Joint Center for Energy Storage Research, though also these concepts have been developed at Harvard with Alan Aspiraguzic when he was there and then moved to the University of Toronto, Mike Aziz and Roy Gordon, looking at ways to accelerate the design of organic materials for redox flow batteries. And the way this loop essentially is, is ideally works is that you have some seed. This is my chemical intuition, um, materials that I'm able to identify from literature. I can then use things like QSPR, quantitative structure property relations, and other sorts of uh, ML enabled redox more designs to expand my envelope of materials and maybe identify uh, better variants of these seed molecules. But then I want to be able to synthesize them. I'd like to be able to do that in an automated fashion rapidly in a high throughput uh, sense. And I want to be able to characterize them to be able to identify whether these materials begin to meet these multi-objective design targets that I've set forth for my redux flow battery. Um, and then ultimately, once I finish this design loop, I want to take this information and combine it with high throughput computing to start to develop broader data sets, uh, which I can draw from. So then I can go into my next design loop to say, I've learned all of this from this loop here, what now would I wanna build coming in next and what new materials do I wanna flow into this? And so this is an example of an approach people are taking to try to accelerate the development of redox active molecules. Now with the remaining time, I'm gonna switch directions here and talk a little bit about um, other aspects of flow battery design. So far, what I've talked to you about is ways that we can improve what's in the tank, but we also wanna care about how do we design the reactor? 
And a nice example of this is over the past decade, um, work from people who have historically worked in the polymer electrolyte fuel cell industry have led to dramatic advances within flow battery operations, starting from early work from Maria Skylos Kazakos, um, and then ultimately moving to more recent work from UTRC uh, as part of an RPE project. And you can see there's been dramatic advances in the performance of redox flow batteries. And a lot of this has been taken from basically taking high quality off the shelf materials from PEM uh, fuel cells um, and then converting them into flow batteries through some minor tweaks uh, uh, in design. So this data was taken with cells that have zero gap architectures, interdigitated flow fields and use thin pretreated membranes, uh, uh, electrodes and membranes. So these are fairly significant advances that can be taken by looking at adjacent fields that are more advanced from us and being able to, to take the best from what they're up to. However, there are challenges that are also unique to this form of energy storage. And one, as an example, but not the only one, is looking at porous electrodes, which actually are central to the operation of a redox flow battery because you have electrochemical reactions that occur in there as well as uh, a transport effects that need to be balanced. And the idea here is within this porous media here, often a carbon paper, electrolyte needs to flow through um, and you need to then have a transport to a fibrous surface and then an electrochemical reaction occurring at that fiber plane. And so what you hopefully see here is that there are multiple properties that are relevant for this material and the relevance of those properties is, is different on different scales, right? And so how do we think about designing these types of materials to be optimized for a redox flow battery where I want to say minimize pressure drop but also maximize conversion per pass or maximize catalytic performance? And so to give you a sense of the challenge, um, this is an example, it's not the only example, but it's an example of a state-of-the-art fibrous carbon electrode making process. This is adapted from an SGL specification sheet. And essentially it's a multi-step process and it's done on a relatively large scale. And many of these materials are used for, 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 uh, for applications other than redox flow batteries. The point is to show you that while there are a variety of different potential designs from different vendors, that are available, if you wanted to sort of try to design uh, systematically different sorts of materials to identify the role of, of different uh, electrode properties um, a, a on flow cell performance, it might be quite difficult because this is a large continuous process and there may not be so easy to sort of make small tweaks uh, in the design. This is one of the reasons why uh, modeling then becomes very interesting in this area. And so the motivation that you, we have is essentially how do we go faster and how do we ask ourselves better questions? And so when we do experiments, if I take, say, some material off the shelf from a vendor, I throw it into a flow battery and I, I, I test the performance metrics, this is limited by time and this is often limited by resources. And so, for example, this is not a, a perfect example, but in, within my laboratory for a full redox flow cell evaluation, the experiment preparation and execution will take 24 to 36 hours, often depending upon the experience of the grad student or the ease of the chemistry that we're using. Um, but if I could do micro, if I could have 3D or 2D macro homogeneous modeling approaches, that would then allow me to shorten that time to as little as about a tenth of an hour um, for these uh, sorts of experiments. What it would allow me to do is then to move away from various weave patterns that I'm able to purchase to say, identifying patterns that I'm not able to purchase, but maybe could be synthesized down the line um, by entrepreneurs to make better materials available for flow batteries. And so these simulation platforms can really provide a utility for screening numerous electrode structures across multiple environments. And so just to give you an example of how something this would be like what this would be done, you can start off with a particular flow cell. And if you're able to then make a three-dimensional modeling domain in a, a software like Comsol or some other multi-physics continuum software, right? You're able then to, I, to, to, to characterize this flow cell performance um, using a 3D molecular, uh, 3D modeling domain. The challenge, of course, in this area is that this could be computationally very expensive and it, it could be resource intensive to use. And so oftentimes we look at opportunities for reduced order modeling, ways that we can kind of reduce uh, the modeling uh, or do domain of our materials and hopefully compare that then to here we have experimental data and then comparisons between a three-dimensional and a two-dimensional modeling. Um, this is using an interdigitated flow field. And this allows us to reduce our polarization data point collection from 30 minutes from the 3D model 
to about 20 seconds uh, for the 2D model. And so there's, this allows us ways to accelerate our, our modeling um, with, through reduced order. What you can then do with this is then begin to screen over multiple different sets of conditions that can be put into the COMSOL model. So as an example here, this 2D model, we were able to generate more than 3000 simulations varying things like the electrode thickness, the porosity of the electrode, the surface area to volume of the electrode, the standard kinetic uh, rate constant of the active materials and the cell, all of which will impact the output current of the battery. Through these 3000 simulations, you're able to then identify ranges of different trends which can then be combined with things like artificial neural networks or genetic algorithms to use the simulated data to train neural networks to maybe validate and test those neural networks and then introduce uh, things like genetic algorithms to identify where maxima might exist within this design space. And once you identify those, 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 those um, maxima, then compare it to something like COMSOL to make sure that you actually you're not creating false maxima within your system. And so sort of these approaches maybe could be useful for accelerating the design of electrode materials for flow batteries. What I talked to you about was a macro homogeneous model. Um, we also have to be interested in approaches for sort of small uh, micro, microscopic platforms. And so this is an example now of some microscopic approaches that we're using. This is structures generated in PoreSpy with the electrochemistry and fluid dynamics developed in an open PNM software. And essentially what we're looking at from these synthesized electrodes is looking at effect of fiber density and fiber disorder and then comparing the current density coming out of these simulations with the dispersion of the electrolyte moving through this pore structure. And what you can see from this, hopefully, is that I can identify then outlier type constructions, which give me some sense as to what uh, useful fiber configurations might be. This could then be coupled to my macro homogeneous models. And then maybe I can go to a particular vendor and say, hey, this might be an electrode structure that we should think about for maximizing performance. So really applying models to obtain these critical electro design features can be helpful for selected manufacturing and testing. Towards the top of my time right now, so I wanna finish with uh, one more slide um, or two more slides and then move on to the next speaker. But really what I hope I've shown you here with the electrodes is a way to close the loop between electrochemical experiments, physics-based modeling and materials discovery by maybe having a closed loop between cell testing and um, computational analysis with data-driven modeling and model-based experiments going between that can allow us to accelerate development of a particular component and maybe extend it to different components within the flow battery. So in conclusion, I wanted to leave us with this slide, which I think is actually quite relevant for the, the, the purpose of this workshop. This is a quote from Professor George Whitesides at Harvard University. Um, it's a long quote. I, I try to highlight what I thought were the most important sections for, for what we wanted to talk about today. And I think really what we're talking about here is models. The combination of experiment and computation is really the idea of developing models to represent more complex classes of related systems and contribute to the study of those classes through the focusing of research on a particular tractable set of problems, right? And we should think about these as thoroughly ingrained in our system of research and analysis. What I've shown you today is models that represent ways for accelerating the discovery of new organic materials for, re for flow batteries, as well as ways to accelerate the design of components for different redox flow cells. But these don't necessarily represent the only set of models that can be used. And I think it's really going to be a combination of these approaches that will help us move and accelerate much more quickly uh, in this design space. So with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention, offer brief acknowledgments, especially to my, my group, uh, Kevin Tenney, who did a lot of work on the, uh, a model, on, the, on the electrode modeling, as well as a number of very uh, 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 excellent external collaborators who have helped us along the years. And with that, I'll make myself quiet and allow uh, Partha to uh, give the next talk. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much. That was a wonderful uh, start to our day. And I think it hits a lot of the keys that we'll talk about during the discussion. So if you have specific questions you're dying to ask, throw them into the Q&A. And again, we'll be giving that after our other speakers. And so with that, I'm gonna let Partha take over uh, with the second talk. All right, uh, thank you, Emily. And thank you, Fake, for a wonderful uh, introduction uh, um, presentation. So let me share my screen. Uh, is it uh, visible? Wonderful, thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Ryan, for the very kind invitation. Also, thank you for uh, to the speakers and audience. Uh, 
uh, to be uh, here today and also listening to uh, some of the perspectives. So today I'm going to talk about electrochemical physics analytics at scales. Uh, to uh, start off, uh, let me show this uh, picture that we painted almost a decade ago, which is still in vogue and uh, definitely demonstrates the multiscale nature of lithium and batteries as an example system. Uh, to just to summarize this, of course, uh, this multi-scale uh, picture here that uh, I mentioned, uh, there are uh, myriad or multiple uh, physical and chemical mechanisms that occur at multiple scales. And those mechanistic interactions are highly coupled and nonlinear. And at the end, those interactions uh, affect system behavior, such as performance, life, and safety of uh, these systems. Uh, so our hypothesis is certainly to understand uh, at least uh, uh, the role of uh, mechanistic complexations, uh, at least uh, that can span over a couple of scales, and uh, and that uh, to relate uh, at the end how that can be related to system behavior, as I mentioned. And for that, I think a uh, mesoscale paradigm probably suits uh, that particular description quite well. And uh, so where we certainly can, uh, could look into the different structure, function, dynamical interactions that are pre predominant in such electrochemical uh, storage systems, such as lithium batteries as an exemplar uh, system that I'm talking about today. Uh, due to the presence of different degrees of freedom, such as electronic, ionic, chemical, and mechanical, uh, multiple spatial and temporal scales. And at the end, hopefully these uh, mechanistic interactions uh, lead to some kind of muso functionality or uh, they are of the sweet spot among uh, different mechanisms that can uh, finally lead us to a better understanding and also probably implications how to improve uh, system uh, descriptors such as performance, life, and safety. In this uh, musical description, I would also like to highlight the inherently in the systems what comes uh, uh, essentially for free or comes uh, intrinsic is also the inherent stochasticity or heterogeneities that also appear at scales. And especially, uh, as we know, uh, all of the typical electrochemical uh, energy systems uh, include uh, some form of porous electron architectures. So keeping this perspective in mind, today I'm going to essentially motivate uh, the part of my presentation today to look into the role of heterogeneities, because we think, I tend to think that heterogeneities are one of that universal descriptor that can essentially uh, connect uh, physics um, at scales. And that can, uh, and also that uh, potentially uh, could be linked to, or uh, efforts could be made, and that require uh, different um, uh, experimental and modeling uh, techniques, or probably the methods, or most importantly, how to bind them together uh, to paint a picture of mesoscale interactions that can uh, finally impact system behavior. Uh, this particular uh, picture you can here, as you can see, uh, essentially a realization of a typical porous electrode architecture, uh, as you would see in a lithium battery, such as probably a typical architecture coming in the you know, porous cathode in this case. And uh, this certainly uh, tells two things. One is essentially uh, heterogeneities are abundant and heterogeneous appear at scales. For example, you certainly have uh, the particle scale heterogeneity coming from the particle morphology shape and also the interface uh, coverage uh, due to the uh, electrochemically inactive phase in this case. You also have this uh, very tortuous pore network and certainly ionic transport is definitely dependent on this uh, long range interaction that you can think about the, at the pore network scale. Uh, electrochemical kinetics is dictated by what's happening at the interface. That means essentially the short range interactions. So the, at the end, uh, the interactions between different kinetic and transport processes at the end affecting your long range and short range interactions. And finally, that uh, has an implication on system behavior. Now, these also uh, heterogeneities, I would like to call them as built heterogeneities or they're apparent coming from uh, the porous uh, electron architectures. And also they are, uh, we could also def define something called stochasticity in order to define uh, heterogeneities, but we can come to that later. Uh, so that's built heterogeneities. I'd also like to bring to your attention that heterogeneities also evolve during operation or operando. For example, in this particular chart I'm showing on, the, on top uh, that how lithium plating, which is could uh, happen at operational extremes such as fast charge or low temperature operation, uh, you can see uh, that the, the lithium plating that can happen in the negative electrode in, in the context of lithium batteries, uh, it's certainly an electro deposition phenomena. So that's a surface driven phenomena being affected intricately uh, by what's happening uh, to the ionic transport in the uh, pore network. And also there's a crosstalk that can happen between the positive and negative electrode. Uh, 
So as you can see here, uh, the uh, morphology and the uh, and the um, and the kinetic uh, descriptors, if you'd like to try to define it that way, at different temperatures, because temperature is and uh, you know has an inherent impact on different processes. They are very different. So as you could see, during, during operational extremes or operando, you also uh, have uh, these heterogeneities that are essentially evolving. Now you can also look at, uh, at a similar uh, analogous picture when you are having uh, lithium electrode dissolution or in the stripping process, you could see uh, if you look into this uh, essentially graphite electrodes, you could see their evolution or electro dissolution process during stripping process. And that can also be connected to the electrochemical behavior and uh, through uh, operando video micro, or let's operando optical microscopy and also videography. So then again, uh, this process, I would like to say that uh, evolving heterogeneity is due to uh, different uh, mechanistic interactions uh, happening uh, during operation. Another such example, you would also see when uh, another operational extremes that may, may so happen that lithium batteries undergo some abuse scenarios, such as electrochemical abuse, for example, lithium ion cells undergoing overcharge, that may lead to at this, as you could see at the electrode and cell level at the real cell format scale, you can see the some lithium plating deposition, which is happen in the anode side. And then go for discharge when you are trying to essentially um, you know, abuse the cell in electrochemical sense, uh, sense uh, during discharge. It may so happen there's another electrochemical process that could happen analogous to lithium plating. It could be copper electrode dissolution, and that can essentially lead to copper deposition on the cathode side. So these are again some examples uh, to draw upon and which suggest uh, that heterogeneities are not only abundant, heterogeneities are uh, appearing in the inbuilt systems, such as the heterogeneous coming from porous electro architecture at scale, but also heterogeneities uh, appear uh, during operation, such as different uh, deleterious or undesirable electrochemical processes, such as lithium electrode deposition leads to lithium plating. And, and also, uh, for example, abuse scenarios that may lead to copper dissolution and also copper deposition. So keeping this heterogeneity picture in mind, let me uh, uh, give a few examples on how uh, physics and analytics could come in handy, or we need to think about physics and analytics at scales if we really try to understand the role of heterogeneities uh, that certainly create those internal, uh, I think, uh, hot spots or chemical soft spots or uh, lead to the gradients inside uh, such structures. So one important thing, just to start up, uh, also I would like to remind ourselves that uh, if you take lithium batteries as an exemplar system, you have inherently an asymmetric uh, electrode structure in uh, due to the very basic nature of constituents of the active material, the morphology, orientation, and the interface uh, coverage and morphology due to the electrochemical inactive phase and so on and so forth. So certainly these two electrodes, although they are porous in, in nature, they're inherently, uh, of course, uh, asymmetric, coming from the structure itself. And so that means your built heterogeneity is also asymmetric. And due to that, it is also has an impact definitely on its uh, internal uh, signatures uh, coming from the, you can think of the ionic transport signature or species diff uh, solid state diffusion signature or reaction signature and so on and so forth. So uh, let's now look a little bit into deeper into that. If we really try to look into the heterogeneities inside this electrode structures, as you can see here, and this structure is uh, a, again from a tomography, extra tomography image, and clearly identifies that uh, built heterogeneities, as I just mentioned, in electrode structure appearing at scale. If we try to interrogate what's happening at the electrode scale, then also the role of heterogeneities, this is what you can see. If we try to map out, let's say, uh, in a particular cross section in that uh, exact uh, extra tomography structure, you could find out what are the local variations coming from the active uh, material phase. Uh, electrochemical inactive phase and also the pore phase. And at the end, these distrib local distributions will finally affect your interfacial active area that scales with your kinetic, uh, kinetic processes at the interface. You also have the electronic conductivity variations and also the pore phase tortuosity, which leads to ionic transport, essentially blockage and, and the ramifications there. So this process is very local. So coming from the built uh, heterogeneity and how it can affect electrochemical and interfacial uh, properties. If that's the case, if you try to essentially simulate the behavior of heterogeneities, you can certainly map out uh, uh, locally what will be the reaction blockage resistance. And that's uh, coming directly 
uh, from your underlying uh, microstructural attributes, as I already mentioned, and local heterogeneities. And on the right hand side, you can a similar one that four network relations that's essentially going to affect your ionic transport. And this on the left hand side, it's going to essentially affect your uh, kinetic uh, interactions at the interface, that means short range and long range interactions. If we try to essentially map out, then finally, that how your intercalation would happen in such electric structure and uh, map the progression of intercalation, for example, in this case, this particular cathode architecture, starting from state of lithiation, you could see the state of lithiation is essentially is not definitely, it's very local, and also it occurs at stages. It essentially tries to fill uh, those most accessible play, uh, locations first, and then at the end, it uh, tend to fill those, uh, I would say that uh, least accessible, uh, both kinetically and transport wise, right? So it's a really cascading process. If that's the case, that means essentially this heterogeneity is affecting your local field variables, which have a direct implication toward the performance and life and safety signatures of those electrodes or the structures, right? And if you look into this further, the reaction front progression at the start of lithiation in the same structure and an end of lithiation, that clearly tells you how this reaction uh, front could be so heterogeneous and the evolution uh, during the operation could be quite heterogeneous. Now let's uh, take uh, try to describe these heterogeneities. And if we try to map out uh, these heterogeneities and describe in some form of a stochasticity parameter, uh, is taken exactly from the tomography image, you could see that this could lead to some kind of stochasticity parameter. And if you try to now map out uh, how uh, their thermal signature and intercalation signature and plating signature will look like. So this is the, for the same structural uh, arrangement that you can see your thermal signature here is very different. Your intercalation signature is this, and your plating lithium plating signature for a particular operation of, uh, of choice is very different. So this essentially tells you that your uh, behavioral pattern that or that you may think about the um, solid state diffusion process, uh, lithium ion transport in the liquid electrolyte, and those uh, are having an implications due to the kinetic and transport interactions, and their ramifications is very different. This is the intercalation, this is plating, and this is your thermal signature, and this. Uh, local heterogeneities that you have from the build structure, their signatures on the thermal uh, and the chemical, uh, electrochemical uh, deposition, in this case, the templating and intercalation is quite different. So they don't happen at the same time. So that's essentially inherent uh, stochasticity uh, is involved in the physical processes that's coming due to the heterogeneities. If we now try to think about uh, heterogeneities are increasing from left to right, their uh, thermal signatures could be very different or the plating signatures should be quite different. So with increasing heterogeneity, your, uh, uh, these local uh, fields will be affected tremendously. And that will certainly uh, will have an impact if we let's uh, try to think about electric deposition as one of those uh, processes of interest in terms of enabling fast charge and whatnot. So they have an implications on the lithium plating severity that we can find probably in some cases uh, could be scaled or scaling law with respect to this inhomogeneity you know, or heterogeneity index uh, from such real built in structures. Let's look into the electrode crosstalk, because as I mentioned that lithium plating is anode centric phenomena, which happens on the anode, but that if we say this uh, uh, evolving structures on the left hand side, as you could see here, where we have a particular cathode. Now, if you keep the same anode, but change it in, uh, cathode structure slightly, same material, slightly change the heterogeneity structure, as you could see, uh, their plating signature at the interface between the anode and uh, separate could be very different. So that certainly tells you two things very important. Heterogeneities are important. Heterogeneities need to be understood and their implications could be quite significant when you think about the asymmetry inherent into the electrodes and the crosstalk. So crosstalk is a very important phenomenon that you need to keep in mind. If we dig a little bit deeper and now look into the same electrode structure as you can see here, and try to find out what are the different particle shapes and morphologies that you have, you will say that the different types of particle morphologies you can have. And if you zoom in and try to see how this particle morphology might have an impact on their intercalation behavior, as you could see that that's essentially progresses very differently. So you may now think about the facets or the, inter, or the particle at the interface, and the intercalation behavior certainly needs to be looked into. And probably this kind of particle scale behavior could also be looked into not only this kind of modeling, but also different X-ray based technique and operandum. Similarly, if we have the similar electrode structures such as graphite, both material is the same, but their, their morphology is very different, as I mentioned, due to the particle morphology and their orientation and their packing, uh, same electron material is the same, but their uh, architecture is very different because of the morphology. You could see one electrode, although both are graphite 
could have a very different implications on its ionic transport resistance in, uh, here uh, measured or uh, calculated in terms of tortuosity. So this tells you at least the role of heterogeneity that essentially we need to have uh, uh, data or information coming from high resolution experimental data, high resolution experiments at scales, and also need to develop equivalent or analogous computational physics models to understand their implications. With this, that in mind, let me uh, tell a little bit of the story about the analytics. Now we know that things are happening at, uh, at, uh, at those electrode scale, and at the end, their implications are, at, of course, at the cell level. One way to understand this role of heterogeneity that uh, could be that uh, we one method we like to call it a three epsilon method in some sense, where uh, by introducing a reference electrode in a minimally invasive way, either at different uh, cell form factors or could be at a material level, electrode level, or different cell form factors, that can give us an unprecedented look at the electrode scale or the state of electrode while the cell is operating. So that means by through this, it can essentially allows it can allow you to deconvolve. The information coming from the cathode potential different uh, evolution, anode potential evolution, in addition to cell voltage and of course temperature evolution, and we could also find out what could be the relevant uh, resistance signatures coming from each of the electrodes. So uh, again, the uh, it is quite difficult to essentially say what is the role that is coming from the different electrodes, and inherently their stochasticity has a uh, role or heterogeneity, heterogeneity has a role to play. Keeping that in mind, this is one of our recent examples that I'd like to show here is that if we really try to understand lithium plating, which we know uh, could be predominant at a low temperature, but also, as you can see, even high temperature with the long-term uh, behavior, you could see that plating, uh, but there is also significant plating at high uh, temperature, 40 degrees Celsius. And that tells us that there is a, a electrode scale heterogeneity and the ramifications is coming from the mechanistic heterogeneity because of this evolving process that's happening, it has a role to play and why the cell behavior, which is exactly happening at a real uh, cell uh, signature that you can get from those kind of three electrode-based analytics. So on the top, this uh, blue chart, you can see there's a, the quantifies the amount of lithium plating energy. That could be a universal descriptor and they can tell that when you have a significant amount of plating energy beyond the threshold, such as one watt hour for this kind of cells, for a particular chemistry, irrespective of the temperature, you can tell you a story. At a low temperature, we expect plating. Suddenly, there is a uh, there is a significant amount of plating energy. At a high temperature, there is significant operating energy, and hence there is a uh, certain decay. Uh, you can see in the behavior, in the cell behavior, or the voltage. Uh, but at room temperature, things are slightly different. So from this kind of studies, then allows us to quantify at the state of electrode, at the electrode scale. At a low temperature, suddenly this phase clearly shows that the end potential go below zero, significant amount of plating, and so is at high temperature. But the key aspects is that it also allows us to uh, study the evolution of the electrode scale resistance. If you try to map it out at a low temperature, suddenly we would say that this uh, performance decay or the knee that you can certain sort uh, voltage decay that you can see here, predominantly coming from the heterogeneities induced by lithium plating. At a room temperature, probably it's a come, uh, essentially a mixture of the ACI or the solid electrode interface formation that's essentially causing the interface resistance evolution and corresponding probably heterogeneity. And that's why you see the signature here. Plating is not playing that role at all. But high temperature, it promotes the ACI process, but at the end it also promotes the uh, lithium plating kinetics and it has uh, shows this heterogeneity here. So this kind of three electrode based method tells us a very interesting story about the heterogeneity induced uh, uh, performance decay that you can see here. For example, in this case, on the low temperature, this is because of plating heterogeneity. On high temperature, it's ACI dependent and an ACI plating heterogeneity that you can see here. Let me conclude with one, probably a couple of more slides talking about the solid solid and liquid solid interfaces. Same story could uh, very well um, work here when you're thinking about lithium metal as this electrode of choice. Uh, for uh, for recent, of course, uh, set of materials, uh, set of cells, and uh, the future generation. If you pair with a liquid electrolyte, we are very aware of the surface in instability that comes in the form of dendritic structures and so on and so forth. But the question on this particular slide I'm showing, you essentially have a lots of mechanistic variabilities uh, triggered by these heterogeneities. But let me give you one example of solid solid interfaces, which are particularly relevant to solid state batteries. If you look into the solid solid interfaces, and uh, solid-state batteries, I would like to highlight that heterogeneity is essentially multiplied. 
And now, if you think about a simple same electrode structure on the cathode side paired with a solid electrolyte, you do not yet have a proper interface description. As such, these are point contacts. And point contacts are the roles of singularities, heterogeneities that essentially have an impact. The interface between two solids are essentially probably a riddle with heterogeneities. So you really need to understand that at different scales, both experimentally and computational modeling. This is one example where we have a better interface or point uh, interface context between the solid electrode and the lithium metal anode, and here the heterogeneous reaction that can otherwise happen. This one example clearly shows that there's a need to essentially describe the electrochemical behavior such as that you can get from symmetric cell, and that similar experiments that has been done uh, using synchrotron x ray based tomography uh, work uh, from Kelsey Hatzel's group here on the left-hand side, that shows that during the stripping electrode, you are essentially have forming this tremendous amount of contact loss. And the nature of the contact loss from the computational modeling we have shown are also on the right-hand picture is coming from the Matt McDowell's group from Georgia Tech for the similar type of experiments, where we're actually showing the interface contact loss comes in terms of point contacts. And point contacts are certainly the pain points, as you could see in the cathode that I've shown. Your description that we learned about lithium battery is still there, but the uh, kinetic and transport description suddenly quite get con convoluted and quite get changed. Let me stop here. And so if you have this point context, as you could see, your interface description is very different. On the right-hand side, your reaction distributions are very, very different. So with that, this is my concluding side to tell you that really, if you need to understand the physics and analytics at scales that has this role of kinetics, interface dynamics, dynamics energetics, you really need to have uh, different types of ways to look into that, interrogate at different scales, often probably a couple of scales at a time. With that, thank you. I'll stop here. Thanks so much, Partha. Wonderful talk, very nice transition from what Vic was talking about. Okay, so we'll move on to our final one uh, with David before we get our general discussion. And again, if anyone has questions they wanna put into the, to the, um, chat, the, the Q and A, they can do that now or wait until the end. So uh, David, up, you're up. Okay, thanks very much, Emily. Uh, and thank you to the organizers for the invitation to speak today. I'm very excited to be here and to share with you my perspective on these topics of the future of energy storage. It's, it's really nice to have a forum where you actually get to talk about the specific topic here, which is the integration of experiment and computational approaches. Oftentimes, you're either on one side or the other trying to convince people of this argument, but um, it's nice to have this focus in this particular series. Um, so just to emphasize, we're talking here, uh, extending this continuation of uh, increased complexity. You just heard about heterogeneity. Now we're going to talk specifically about interfaces. So that one dimension extending out from an interface and we'll focus on uh, X-ray spectroscopy and simulations to support that. Uh, this work was done at the Molecular Foundry, which is a national user facility for nanoscience. We do our work uh, free of charge as a collaborative entity. And you're all welcome to uh, submit proposals here anytime you want to do collaborations with us. Um, there's a little bit of a shift in lens scale here. Our focus or our goal is to obtain a microscopic or molecular scale understanding of functioning energy relevant materials so we can develop design rules for the chemistries involved. And the tools that we use are typically first principles methods, so called because they uh, don't require experimental inputs nominally, like density functional theory. Um, extending those approaches to simplified models of the free energy landscape in these materials using free energy sampling. And then uh, definitely a focus always in our group of mission of experiment to try to validate these models. So what's nice about energy storage as a topic is that it has a rich amount of physics that we could explore. Um, there's a lot going on in a battery, even though you know, this technology has been around since the 19th century or even before. Um, but there's a lot of charge dynamics, uh, molecular dynamics in the electrolyte, uh, strongly correlated electron phenomena in your electrodes, uh, potentially. And you know, when you think about the complexity, if you, if you think upwards, let's say from molecules and atoms up to materials, you realize that it becomes quite a complex problem, especially when you make interfaces between materials and you want to understand the pathways for the specific you know, fundamental operations of the cell, how electrons arrive into the electrodes and meet the ions coming out of solution, how that desalvation process happens, how the reverse happens when you resolvate those ions as they lose their electrons and reemerge into the electrolyte. 
And can we develop, you know, what is essentially a simplified vision of what that process looks like, despite the complexities that exist and persist in these materials. And similar to the previous talk, we could talk about scales, right? So there's lots of different uh, time and length scales that are relevant, all of them relevant across uh, the functioning of an energy storage system like a battery, uh, from individual electronic and atomic or molecular processes that occur maybe on femtosecond or sub-second time scales, so-called ultra-fast processes, all the way up to nanoseconds and human timescale perspectives, microseconds and seconds and so on. And so if you want to tackle problems in this space, you do have to be flexible as a computational scientist to be able to think about modeling molecules and materials and their interfaces. And so, as we said already, a suite of techniques is probably what you need. And to complement the previous talks, I'm going to focus more on the um, quantum mechanical and molecular side of things. But we have continue modeling as well. A full suite of tools or collaborations between different groups is definitely necessary in this field. Um, just to give you an example, and this is not supposed to be too pessimistic, but um, it's to really put things in perspective and highlight the need for experiment. So if you look at the numbers involved, what could you hope to simulate? So back in 2014, which is, you know, it's not that long ago, um, we had this, what we thought was a, a monster calculation, which was the use of ab initio molecular dynamics to study water next to a gold interface. So not really an electrochemical system as such, but a, a fruit fly, if you will, for what happens when you might bias an interface and influence the molecular liquid. And we asked the question, okay, maybe in 10 years time, which you know, we're getting close to now, we could simulate maybe a thousand times larger or 10 times longer, would that be enough? And with the goal of maybe observing electrochemistry in action. So one thing you can do is a simple dimensional analysis and just translate units that we typically think about for working electrochemical cells. So a typical battery might have a current density here of about 10 milliamps per centimeter squared. Okay, if you're thinking about a fuel cell or an electrolyzer, this could be hundreds to amps, uh, hundreds of milliamps to amps, but a uh, typical battery is about this range. And if you convert that into units that we're more used to thinking about when you build a simulation, you put all the molecules together and work out how many electrons you'd have, and then what size could you simulate in the simulation box and how long could you run for? You get some staggering numbers here that really put things in perspective. So 10 milliamps per centimeter squared is amounts to six-ish electron transfer events net, so in, in one particular direction, uh, per microsecond per 100 nanometers squared. So a square of, of a side 100 by 100. So <laughs> if we had to go up to that, um, we're talking about you know thousands of times larger, 10 times longer. That, that was my estimate over the top here. Actually, we need maybe on the order of 10 to the power of 10 times the simulation time that we currently have right now, if we want to see actual electrochemical events occurring with some regularity. So that's a kind of a, it puts things really in perspective to say, well, simulating the function of a battery in real time is maybe, you know, not something that you'd want to use a molecular scale approach for. Uh, maybe you want to think about a different approach or be smart about it and you know take guidance from experiments and think about modeling certain scenarios or the the overall behavior the thermodynamic behavior of a cell or its non-equilibrium behavior under certain conditions and so we we have taken that to heart and now we're applying those techniques to look at beyond lithium-ion technology so I, I won't spend too long to motivate this. Uh, Fick did a great job of talking about future energy storage solutions that we might be interested in. Um, many of us are familiar with the, the disadvantages of lithium ion technologies. Uh, we need to increase capacity, voltages may not be large enough. There's some safety concerns and breakdown of cells and so on. And there's some interesting proposals. Uh, Fick mentioned sulfur, multivalent ions is another one, which I'll talk about briefly here. So for example, magnesium. Um, and you have to think a little bit differently about how you build your cell in those cases. One of the main things to think about by why multivalent, beyond the obvious getting more electrons per cation. So if you have a two plus cation, every time you get certain you get two electrons, so that's a boost. 
um, you also have maybe more access to more abundant materials. So it's maybe a more sustainable option. There's plenty of magnesium around, there's plenty of calcium around, there's plenty of zinc. Uh, and so maybe those are better options for a future that's sustainable in terms of electric energy storage, where we are already seeing some tightness in terms of lithium supply around the world. In addition, there's some fundamental limitations. If you think about the engineering of scaling up the size of a battery, and increasing the the objects that can be moved with electrical energy storage so at some point um, the size of the battery starts to outweigh the payload that you want to deliver, whether that's passengers on an airplane or whether that's uh, cargo on a, a large truck and so you have to think about okay if there's a fundamental limitation on the amount of capacity you can get in the battery then maybe switching to a different chemistry might make more sense and so sulfur is particularly attractive in that area not that we have very many working sulfur cells right now um, but this factor of you know six or so increase in capacity would make for a, a really a significant game changer if we want to uh, push electrification into the transportation sector beyond light duty vehicles like cars Okay, but anyway, back, back to modeling for a second. So um, if we want to think about modeling these systems across different length and time scales using the methods that I described, how do we validate those models, particularly for interfacial processes, the functional aspects of electrochemical energy storage? So one of the techniques that we have been coupling with uh, from an experimental point of view is X-ray spectroscopy. And so uh, just very briefly, you can write down the expression. This is the Fermi's golden rule expression for um, X-ray absorption intensity. What it's essentially doing is it's looking at unoccupied electronic structures, so the empty states. If you, if you know semiconductor physics, those would be the conduction bands. If you're a molecular person, that's the, the LUMO, lowest occupied molecular orbital and higher orbitals. So you're looking at those electronic features. It's element specific because you specifically cite a core electron on one particular atom. And then it has some nice symmetry uh, due to the dipole selection rule that gives you some directionality. You can see the differences between orbitals oriented in different directions. To put that in some perspective, imagine you have a molecule floating around inside a solution. It has different chemistry, so you can tune your X-rays to see that specifically. You can look at local molecular structure, maybe how that's influenced by solvation. And then as you go higher in energy, your excitations necessarily grow in size and you begin to see more about the surrounding environment as well. So it's a very useful tool for learning about that. Um, in addition, technology has advanced and now we have a suite of techniques that allow us to measure details that happen right next to active interfaces. So um, Ethan Crumlin here has been pushing uh, uh, a technique that allows you to look at active electrodes using X-ray photo emission spectroscopy, which tells you about the charge state of ions next to interfaces in this case. And Jinghua Guo and Mikhail Salmeron have been working on um, X-ray absorption spectroscopy in a flow cell where you can see details happening within one to two nanometers of a working electrode under bias. Both techniques are operando, so you can vary voltage and learn about changes in the chemistry of your electrolyte while the cell is working or your electrode if that happens to be the element that you're probing. And we were fortunate enough to get to collaborate with the X-ray absorption folks early on. And one of the first applications we looked at was this fruit fly uh, golden water interface where we could validate in that case, based on our modeling, that the only interpretation that made sense was that these interfacial measurements were actually sensitive to that first one to two nanometers right next to the gold interface. Um, I don't have enough time in 20 minutes to tell you all the details of that, um, but you have to take it from me that that was uh, the particular land scale that seemed to be relevant in this case. So armed with this knowledge, going back to the computational requirements, how, how would you make sense of experiments like this when they're maybe applied, let's say, to a multivalent electrolyte? Okay, so the key thing here is that the spectrum reflects both the chemical species that might be present, so those have certain fingerprints, let's say, and their population. So that's the quantitative aspect, how much of each might be present in a given measurement. The challenge is that we don't have spectral standards for interfacial species, right? Normally in spectroscopy, you know that species A looks like this, species B looks like this. If you see some linear combination of the two, you can easily disentangle that. Um, but if you don't have those initial fingerprints, that disentanglement can be quite difficult to do. 
And so that's often when you'll see collaborations between experimental efforts and theory in this regard to try to develop those fingerprints, first of all, and then use that predictive approach, hopefully, to disentangle the experiment and tell you how much of each species might be present at the interface. Okay, so let's switch gears a little bit and talk about the difficulty of trying to model a multivalent electrolyte just to start with, right? How would you do that? And be, you know, to contrast with that gold water system, I didn't have any ions in that system at all. If I put ions in solution, uh, the ion and its counter ion, so the cation and the anion, they may see each other. Usually the salvation environment in an aqueous system is good enough to keep those ions apart. Like if you put salt into water, it fully dissolves. But in a multivalent electrolyte, typically, to increase the voltage stability window of the electrolyte, you don't use water because that has quite a narrow window of voltage stability. You use an organic solvent instead. And then because you have higher charge on your cations, right there, two plus or maybe even three plus cations, they have much stronger Coulomb interactions and they really want to go back and find their counter ions and maybe precipitate as a salt. So solubility in experiment is an issue. In simulation, it's even worse because you model a finite system and what can happen is that the normal Debye screening, which comes from the ions in the solution kind of screening each other's interactions by responding to changes in arrangement, as soon as any pair of ions find each other, let's say a cation and some anions meet up and neutralize, now you've lost that Debye screening and it can lead to a kind of precipitative catastrophic event where basically your simulation runs to a point where all of your ions end up in one corner bound to each other. So you need to think carefully about how you run your simulations and what the initial conditions might be and how they might influence the outcome. And to do that, we use free energy sampling. So you can think about the normal dynamics in the system governed by some Hamiltonian. You want a simplified understanding of the system or maybe you think about its free energy in terms of a small number of collective variables that you care about. Okay, we'll talk about what they might be, but maybe coordination number of an ion or its distance from an interface. Those might be two interesting collective variables. And then you can bias your molecular dynamics methods so that you begin to sample this free energy space. One way is using what's called umbrella sampling, where you introduce a, an effective spring that says, well, I want my collective variable of choice, X in this case, to be within a certain range defined by some kind of harmonic potential. Um, and that's a very useful way to do one dimensional free energy sampling. Um, another approach is metadynamics where you say, okay, I'm gonna, it's like Hansel and Gretel. I'm gonna remember where I was. I'm gonna drop a little breadcrumb where I was before. And then I won't revisit that area again uh, because it will kind of keep me away from there. And so if you add up all those breadcrumbs at the end, you can learn about the path that was followed and the propensity of those breadcrumbs in different areas defines the depth of the local free energy potential in that region of phase space. And that's a very useful approach to explore free energy landscapes. So here's the problem, right? In a multivalent um, electrolyte, imagine you have, let's say in this case, magnesium in THF, and it turns out that if you start your simulation with a number of molecules around the magnesium that is either six or five, you can sample your molecular dynamics as long as you like. Um, and within the timescales you have access to on current computers, you might see a persistence of those initial conditions. And so you've got one experiment here that's giving you two competing results. Uh, how do you make sense of this? And clearly there must be some kind of free energy landscape that looks like this, where there's two possibilities likely how would you explore that? Like, how do you know what's the propensity of these two? Or is one more stable than the other and dominates, right? And so we, we've started kind of revising how we talk about electrolytes and the ions within them to remove the definite article. We don't talk about the salvation environment anymore because there may be multiple. And we think about how we would sample that space. And so you can use the coordination number as a collective variable and begin to scan the coordination number to see how does the free energy change um, within the, the solution as you vary coordination number. And so this is a schematic example where you might imagine three possible minima um, in your overall free energy landscape. And that implies three different salvation environments, different numbers of solvent molecules around the ion. Um, and that's interesting too, to think about from a theoretical perspective, because 
redox chemistry is kind of somewhat controlled by this salvation environment. Um, the amount of salvation or the salvation free energy dictates how deep your redox potential might be, how stable those species are. And what we're learning here is that you could be fooled into thinking you understand the electrochemistry of your electrolyte and when redox processes begin and what biases or what potential differences, because actually it's the least stable of these objects which will be the first to be reduced. And so maybe the, the onset of your current is dominated by uh, a minority species that has some relative stability. You know, it has a local minimum in free energy, but that's the one that defines your current initially. And if that is the one that also defines some parasitic process, maybe the breakdown of the electrolyte or the growth of a solid electrolyte interface, that would be the one to tackle from a chemical point of view and not the most stable dominant majority species that you can see easily in your solution. So it gives you a different perspective on how you might tease out these details and learn where to focus your efforts from a materials design point of view. Um, another thing we learned while doing this study is that if this is indeed the case, if you have significant local minima and free energy for each of these different environments, and we know that the interactions between the cation and the surrounding solvent or anions are strong, so enthalpic, um, there must be a strong entropy contribution that leads to these stable minima because the energetics just wouldn't add up. And it turns out that's true. If you take, um, this is an example of contact ion pair formation in this uh, magnesium-based electrolyte with TFSI as the counter ion. So a solvent separated pair, at, let's say room temperature, so that's green here, is not quite as stable as a contact ion pair with a monodentate connection. And then the bidentate connection over here where it's coupled to two atoms of the counter ion is it slightly less stable. Now, as we increase the temperature, what we find is that uh, this more contacted object becomes more stable and the solvent separated pair less stable. Or if we reduce the temperature, the opposite happens. You have this ability to tilt your free energy landscape to vary the content of your electrolyte in terms of the connectivity of the different species within it. So um, if you then extend these studies to look at the interface itself, you learn some surprising facts. One being that anions, which you'd expect to be in the solution and dissolved and around the cations, tend to favor being next to the interface, which is surprising, even when the electrode is charged negatively. So you have negative species sitting next to the electrode, and that's because they hate being inside the solvent. And that's very counterintuitive compared to, you know, what is basically 19th century level theory of how Helmholtz layers are formed, how electric double layers are formed, and how ions separate at interfaces when they become charged. And then you can extend those studies to look at um, free energy sampling as a function of coordination number and distance from your electrode and begin to learn that there's a whole host of different species that might be present at the electrode interface, many of which are dominated by coordination of the cation with several anions. And worst of all, what we found is the most dominant species in this particular case at a, let's say, an inert interface is the neutral species, not, not a charged species at all. So this is kind of a surprising outcome here where magnesium coordinated with two different anions happens to be the happiest right next to the negatively charged interface. And the, negative, the negatively charged species is also there here at a similar free energy and the positive species as well, slightly above that. So the really the one you would expect which would be the completely uh, free cation is, is nowhere to be seen in this picture and this explains some of the difficulty for getting these multivalent systems to work at all because you have to begin to separate those ion pairs to eventually get electro deposition of your metal or insertion of your metal into your electrode so i've kind of talked about this already um, so just to summarize you know you do need uh, a suite of techniques to begin to make sense of these kinds of experiments. They're complex experiments, and necessarily they require some theoretical interpretation. But similarly, we have a difficult challenge as computational scientists to try to model these systems. And so we rely on those experiments as well. So we're really back in you know, what should have been the way these uh, fields should evolve is that there's a hand-in-hand uh, -hand partnership between experiment and theory here. And I think that's a, a great way for this science to advance. Um, with that, I'd like to thank my key collaborators here and also the Department of Energy for most of our funding. 
uh, computation resources at NERSC and uh, major funding actually from the Joint Centre for Energy Storage Research, which funds both myself and also FIC that you heard from earlier um, to do a lot of work in this area beyond lithium ion research. And thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, David. And thank you to all of my speakers, uh, our speakers today. I think that was a really um, great outlook on issues of experimentation and, and integration of computation and experimentation. So um, at this time, I'll ask David to stop sharing his screen and our speakers to turn on their cameras again. Um, David, we took over your camera because there were some bandwidth issues, but you can, I think you'll be okay now. <laughs> and we'll open it up for a uh, question and answer for, for uh, the next uh, 15 to 20 minutes before we have to go. And maybe I'll, I'll start us off. And again, um, for the audience, please feel free to um, add questions to the Q&A feature of the webinar, and I'll, I'll be happy to ask those our speakers. Um, so to, to um, one thing I heard from, from all, of, all of you really is this importance of interfacial and what I'd call meso, meso scale architectures and um, how they, they play a very big role in the actual operation of whatever device we're looking at, battery, fuel cell, et cetera. So I agree, I, I work in that area. I think it's an important area, but the question I'd have, and this goes to where I think David started is, we'll never be able to resolve everything at an atomic level, right? You just can't do it. Um, is it important for us to try and bridge all levels to get that overall picture or is focusing on kind of some of these interfacial features, some of these porous features gonna get us there? So do we need this kind of overarching holistic view of everything or are there certain areas that we should focus on to get the most out of? And, and anyone's welcome to speak up there, um, however you feel, feel like it. Or I can, if I have to force myself, I'll call on somebody. <laughs> Just like in class, right? So I don't know, maybe Farley, do you have any thoughts on, on kind of where our attention should be be, um, be focused at what scales we really need to focus on or is it all of them? I think that's a great question. And also, I think it reflected among all of the different, all the three talks, I think uh, quite consistently. I, I think um, maybe if I need to give one perspective viewpoint, essentially it's uh, definitely clear that the role of interfaces and the structures in addition to the matter. So matter structure interface is definitely very critical in electrochemical energy systems. But when uh, there's a gap, I would like to highlight the gap, and there's a gap, how we translate, uh, let's see the knowledge that we are generating using um, uh, different computational experimental techniques at different scales, which are probably relevant at different scales and also most effective at different scales, how to translate that in a rather, um, I would say the meaningful way to those few uh, system quantifiers, the descriptors, that's the gap. And if you think about a gap, I think uh, in that sense, keeping in mind, so somehow uh, to, to, to motivate that, uh, I think um, uh, what we probably need to do, and that's probably a little bit of my personal perspective here, probably let's talk about a couple of scales <laughs> and two scales and or three scales. And if that is possible to uh, resolve and understand and translate that information between scales and, uh, and hopefully that can connect. So the question is that hopefully can we connect to system descriptors? There is a gap there. And then uh, uh, interface level and that translate the information into probably architecture level, probably the, you know, there are lots of, you know, I think progress has been made. Uh, but do you have a direct descriptor coming here and fits back into the upper scale? It's still, um, still, I think, a challenge. So I would say that let's talk about a couple of scales. And, uh, and that scale could be motivated by, the, uh, by what you're looking for to, um, to, to, to derive from your experiments or simulations or modeling. And then uh, pair it with a tandem experiment and a tandem computational, uh, I think, either, uh, uh, I think, a mechanism or physics and probably corresponding tool. That's where I would start. Probably I'll stop here, let others speak, but this is my viewpoint. Probably two scales at one time. <laughs> I like that. Maybe Fick, what are, you, what are your thoughts? You maybe had the most holistic view or you started at the most holistic view of the systems. Yeah, I, I agree with much of what uh, Parther mentioned there. Um, I, I think maybe what I would add is that, um, <clears throat> excuse me, some of it depends upon what are the knowledge that you're trying to go after, right? Um, and oftentimes you can look at a particular process very, very carefully on the atomistic level if you're going after a particular piece of information. But I don't think you would necessarily expect, as I think David showed very beautifully, 
to be able to connect understanding from the large scale system continuously all the way down to the atoms um, within an energy storage media, right? There have to, there's gonna be processes that couple upwards and processes that couple downward. Um, another challenge, of course, with this coupling, I think as Parth and David know quite well, is uncertainty, right? Uncertainty at one scale can just blow up any sort of conclusions that you would have on another scale because you, you know, it's just the error bars are too large. Um, and so I think a lot of this has to do with some understanding of the processes that we're trying to understand. Um, and then sort of more hypothesis driven work to try to uh, begin to identify what do we think are the critical factors uh, that would be connected across. But I think sort of a brute force approach of connecting everything um, is, is likely to be uh, very challenging. I, I agree. Maybe David, your thoughts on this, especially since I know you've done some of this with JCs or in other areas of your work. Yeah, I, I think I, I definitely echo that point about brute force, you know, at some point, if all you're doing is recreating as complex a system in your model as the real world, then what have you learned, right? You'll have a data mining problem instead of, you know, the, the unknowns that you had an experiment. And so it can be challenging. Um, I, I think one thing that might be missing is, you know, we, we don't have, let's say often, we don't have readily transferable, um, models that simulate the entire operation of a cell and its behavior that would have parameters that we could begin to ask the question of, well, is this the parameter that depends on the scale? When does this parameter matter? You know, if it's a rate or if it's a, a particular turnover frequency, whatever it might be. And then there's two contexts in which such a model might be useful in my view. One is if you have a particular chemistry you care about, a diagnostic tool, right? Why is it not working now? What's wrong with it? How do I fix it? Or uh, am I running the cell in the wrong way? And that's maybe more interesting to industry if they're operating a car and they want to stay within a stable window of voltage, perhaps. But then on the flip side, if that cell is never going to work, I do have material design requirements that I would need to generalize to say, okay, this particular chemistry only admits a certain range of parameters for this particular physical process. How do I go beyond that? How do I get to the next level to design a battery for a jet or for a marine vessel, something like that? And so in that case, if you do really want to do materials design, at some point you will have to connect to the molecular scale or the atomistic scale, right? Materials properties start to become important then. And so I'd, I'd go back to Partha's point that, yeah, you kind of, you have to jump around a little bit and begin to pick your, your scale for when it matters. But the key thing is to have an underlying model that you can reference to say, yeah, this is telling me that now molecular scale issues are or no, it's nanoscale morphology and tortuosity is the issue, or it's it's just the rate at which I'm running the cell. It's like a simple differential equation can tell me what's wrong. And so it, it really does depend, but you need that model to make that call. I think those are they're very great answers, and I, I completely agree. And it also makes me think, I mean, Fick was the only one who explicitly mentioned it, but I know none of us really ignore the issues of using machine learning and data science to try and help um, bridge some of those gaps or reduce the computational cost um, in some way. And, you know, that leads to the question of, and depending on who you ask, they'll give you very different answers, or how much do we want to integrate or supplement with these machine learning techniques and these data science techniques that seem to have um, great possibilities, but also they have their limitations, right? So how much of the physics do we want to lose to gain in speed? And I don't know if anyone has thoughts on, on areas where, where it is appropriate or is not appropriate to start to utilize some of those aspects. We'll switch it up. We'll, I'll guess I'll go back to Partha, because Vic talked about it a little bit in his work. <laughs> So uh, thanks, Emily. I think uh, once again, uh, great uh, discussions. So I think uh, I will uh, start off with by saying is that I think um, uh, identifying uh, when and where not to use it, or uh, that's probably the key. And that's certainly, uh, you know, if we approach the problem from that regard, that's where the key is. The question is that how much we depend on the data, how much we depend out of the data, experimental realizable data, appearing at a particular scale that we're really trying to look into and from a simulated data. And I think this is where I tend to kind of think, and I believe uh, when I come back and you know, it kind of comes back to uh, me that 
Uh, in some sense, I like this uh, stochastic generator realization structures. In some sense, uh, they may or may not fit into the bill. You know, now we have X-ray tomography can generate lots of data, right? So it's a good thing. I think we are at a stage, I believe, where we could look into different types of data, segments of data, and either coming from simulation or experiments and try to ask ourselves, what are you trying to get at? Are you trying to directly looking at, let's say, as an exemplar system and structure directly to their how it will look like, uh, you know, how it would uh, affect the electrochemical uh, performance? Well, maybe we need to think a little bit harder. Uh, are you missing any uh, scales? Are you missing any mechanisms by overlooking, uh, uh, you know, or, or, or let's say over relying on the data that either way coming from simulation experiments, that's what I look at. But one thing it definitely, I would, def I would like to accept that probably this is the right time <laughs> to think about uh, such uh, tools and techniques uh, to integrate, uh, but be careful what you're trying to look for and integrate at, again, uh, mindful of the scale. And that is very important. And I try to say that in a way that we have, uh, let's say cell level experimental data coming from batteries or anywhere. Well, uh, are we in, are we really trying to look into you know let's say the life life prediction is is a very interesting thing you know I mean, you know that we have some uh, real cell level data try to really do some prognostics with it I think there is some merit. The question is that what are we missing there? <laughs> there are so many different variables uh, that are, uh, that affect the life uh, prediction. So maybe there is a blend up uh, some physical mechanisms blended into that machine learning framework. That's what is needed. That's the lofty goal. It's not easy. That's my viewpoint. And again, I'm not an expert in Samsung, but definitely I'm looking into some of those the tools, how it can be applied, per se, in my perspective. I'll stop there. Thanks, Mark. I don't know if David wants to chime in before, or Vic. Yeah, I mean, it's such a broad field, machine learning. Um, just a, a couple of pointers, if, if people want like, keywords they can remember. So um, definitely in the field of molecular simulation, there's people are using deep neural networks to do faster simulations. So so-called deep MD is, is one example from Princeton. There are many others. And, and that's just using the abundance of data for molecular dynamics to learn a potential so you can more quickly do the same simulation. So that, that's great. More of that would be excellent. Um, now on the experimental side, I think there's, there's a couple of problems. One is classification of data. You know, it's, it's one thing as part of said to have lots of data now, but what does it mean? <laughs> is it good data? Is, you know, does the data that you see tell you that you have a good battery or a bad battery, right? And a lot of decision trees in machine learning are kind of defined on making that call from the experts, right? The, the Netflix users of batteries, let's say, who uh, like this movie and may like the next one. Um, so you need a lot of expert knowledge to kind of get in there and make those calls. I think that's one problem. Often we don't have enough data, and then maybe techniques like reinforcement learning would be better. They don't rely on a huge amount of data, but they can help you make decisions to reach a certain endpoint, which might be as simple as just the cell works, right? Um, and then in terms of learning something, um, there's some really nice techniques on dimensionality reduction where you have lots of data coming in, but what you learn in the process, there's a few key things that matter in there. And that, literally emerges from the data itself, not from your physical intuition, but then if you can match that to a physical model, so much the better. I, I completely agree with those sentiments. Um, Vic, can I give you the last word on machine learning? I mean, you did talk about it. You could. Uh, I don't have too much to add uh, on, on the responses by Parth and David. I think it's just the one thing is that uh, I wouldn't consider myself an expert on machine learning whatsoever, but I think it is a useful tool. Um, and it should be thought of as a useful tool, but like any tool that you have in your arsenal as a scientist, it needs to be used appropriately to ask the right questions, and it needs to be backed up by a series of other tools to ensure that the results that you're getting out are actually uh, of the, the appropriate quality. Can you validate you know, with another methodology? And so that's how we've, we've started to use it, though I've seen incredible things coming from other laboratories in this area, and I, I think it's going to play a big role. Um, in, in, in our future. Thank you. I think that's great. And that's a good point of the expertise. I mean, especially as software and uh, um, availability grows with these tools, the idea of using it to get an answer is great. But if you don't know what you're doing, it's the same with the computational modeling, right? If you don't know what you're putting in, you have no clue what you're getting out. So I, I think that's a really great thought to end on. Um, and actually, we are out of time. And I don't like to keep people more 
uh, than, than we said we would, because we've all got plenty going on. But um, I do want to take this moment to just, again, thank you so much for being here to our speakers. I really enjoyed hearing um, everything you had to say and really integrating uh, experimental and computational. And another round of thanks to our co-sponsors. So this is brought to you by the Institute for Sustainable Energy and co-sponsored by both the College of Engineering and Material Science and Engineering here at BU. And then if Wally can pick up the last slide, thank you. Um, I just want to remind everybody in the audience and our speakers as well that we have um, three more wonderful sessions going on, uh, one in two weeks and then two more in February. And I think our speakers today brought in a lot of the, the themes that we're going to be talking about because we talked about interfacial phenomena. I heard some talk about long-term operation. And then obviously we're all curious as to know where the next technologies are, really what the future of these systems are. So I, I hope you'll all join us. Uh, you can go to the ISE website to register for those. And I really look forward to hearing what all of our speakers for this series have to say. So with that, um, thank you all and thank you for being here. Uh, and again, this will be recorded. This is recorded and will be available on the ISC website if anyone wants to go back and see it. So thank you. Thank you, Vic, Partha, and David. Thank you. Bye. Thank bye -bye. you. Bye-bye, everyone. Hey, thanks, Emily. That was great.